This week, I'm joined by Matt Alderman and John Strand to discuss Microsoft acquiring a company called Blue Talon. Arduino has selected Auth0 as a standardized login for their open source ecosystem. A new code signing solution is released by Venify. ExtraHop issues a warning. And in our second segment, we talk about evaluating security vendors in prep for Black Hat. In the final segment, Charles Thompson, the Senior Director of Product Management at Viavi Solutions, joins us to talk about threat hunting. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Prevention-based tools leave you blind to threats inside your network. By adding network traffic analysis to your SOC, you can find and stop attackers before they make their move. ExtraHop provides complete visibility at enterprise scale. Detect threats 95% faster with machine learning that helps tier one analysts perform like seasoned threat hunters. Visit extrahop.com forward slash security weekly to learn why the SANS Institute calls ExtraHop fast and amazingly thorough. That's extrahop.com forward slash security weekly. Networks are becoming increasingly complex and fragmented, and digital transformation and DevOps are driving an explosion in network connectivity changes. With each new network connection, cyber attackers may gain another opening to breach or traverse the network. At Tufin, they've pioneered a policy-based approach to network security management using automation and analytics. As a result, you can make network changes in minutes instead of days reliably and securely. To learn more about Tufin, the security policy company, go to securityweekly.com forward slash Tufin and sign up for a free evaluation. By the end of 2020, 99% of exploited vulnerabilities will be publicly disclosed and known to IT system admins. The consequences of that fact means the burglar will already be in your house because you left the front door wide open by failing to patch known vulnerabilities. How can you keep the threat actors out? Through cloud-based automation, Automox enables you to slam the door on unpatched OS and third-party vulnerabilities across your entire Windows, Mac, and Linux infrastructure. Take advantage of a free trial with Automox to not only see the vulnerability status of your infrastructure, but do something about it within minutes. Start automating the fundamentals of cyber hygiene at securityweekly.com forward slash Automox. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Automox. Welcome to episode 147 of Enterprise Security Weekly for, is it July 31st today? It is July. Yeah. I thought it was yeah, August 1st. It, it is. is July 31st. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined by Matt Alderman and John Strand. Matt, welcome. Happy hump day. Less than a week to Black Hat. That's it. John Strand is here with us. John, welcome. Hello, hello, hello. I'm trying to stay hydrated, doing yoga and all kinds of meditation to get ready for the next week. Is that the secret? Yoga? I don't know. I'm gonna. Tr I'm trying new things, Paul. <laughs> I'm trying new things because I'm. It's never. I'm never prepared enough. I hear you. I hear you. Um, we have exciting news about the Security Weekly webcast program. We are now partnered with ISC Squared as an official CPE provider. If you're attending any of our webcasts, you will be receiving one CPE credit per webcast. One and only one. Even if you bribe us, it's still one. Uh, although we, I'd still accept the, the bribe. But register for our upcoming webcast with Zane Lackey of Signal Sciences. Go to securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts. Register for that. Uh, Zane, Matt, and myself will be talking about application security, specifically using our internal application that we uh, have been developing for quite some time now as an example of how you do a build system or how we propose that you do a build system open to feedback and how you would protect that at the various stages of the build, including in production. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, as many of you know, I've been doing mostly development for the past couple of months. In fact, we're pushing out a release today. Yay. If you uh, want to check out any of our previous webcasts, go to securityweekly.com uh, forward slash on demand and you still get credit for those uh, CPE credits. If you're trying to make a big splash at Black Hat this year, do we have a slot available on Paul Security Weekly? I think we have like one or two slots left, and that's it. We're booked. We're booked. We have three slots. All the micro interviews are booked. We have Paul's Security Weekly, our most downloaded show, ironically enough. Uh, so you, you definitely want to go to securityweekly.com forward slash booking 
and submit your request uh, and, and get on that show while we're at Black Cat because we're recording it live at Black Cat and it's going to be awesome. So on to the security enterprise security news. Where do you guys want to start? Start at the very beginning. All right. Aqua Security has introduced new native or introduces native runtime protection for Pivotal Cloud Foundry. What is Pivotal Cloud Foundry? Not so, so part of them. I actually went through this. Um, one of the things that's really cool about this this little write up is it starts out like it's going to be another crap. Like you know, like a lot of the stuff that shows up in Global Security Mag is just written by an intern in marketing who has no idea what they're doing. Yeah, it's like a shortened, a shortened version of the press release, John, that we get from from it that is. site. Yeah. It, it's a it's a good site. It's good information, but it's very uh, yeah. markety and not a lot of details. But then this one changes, and what uh, it does right in the middle, and I think every single vendor should take note, is they break down in bullet points exactly what it does. So like Aqua Security for PCF has two tiers. For the standard, it'll scan application for vulnerabilities, provision policies and block unauthorized applications, scan and monitor application container artifacts for vulnerabilities, malware, apply host assurance policies. That's straight, to the point, clean, uh, not ambiguous at all. And then they talk about the advanced features as well. So this was a fantastic little write-up. Um, so hats off to Mark Jacob, I think, is the one that put this one together from the press release from Aqua Security because it tells me exactly what this damn thing does. Matt, what um, do you think of Aqua? It, yeah, I mean, look, this, they've done this for other platforms. So Pivotal is mm -hmm. uh, the container platform under Pivotal. Aqua's been doing a lot of work with VMware over the uh, last couple of years. Pivotal is a sister company to VMware, part of the old oh, EMC Federation that's okay. now part of Dell. So that's yeah. VMware's container platform. Yes, yep. exactly. Gotcha. So, so this is this makes a lot of sense because mm -hmm. my my prediction is VMware is probably going to buy Aqua Security soon. You know, now yep. that we've seen some movement in the container security space, it's a good right? indicator, we, right? <laughs> yeah, and and you know, Twistlock got bought by Palo, mm -hmm. Laird Insight got bought by Qualys. I think VMware was waiting for the right time to figure out when yeah. they pull a trigger. And my guess is they'll do something sooner than later. That leaves and, a, a, just a couple of players in the market in for container security that haven't gotten bought out. Uh, StackRox being one. And Sysdig, which is and a Sysdig. sponsor on ASW. Yeah, Sysdig yeah. does a lot more than just container security. They do well. They, yeah, I mean, I well, well, the reason I like Sysdig a lot is because they do a combination of container monitoring, more from an application performance perspective, yeah, and container security, gotcha. which I think is the opportunity. If you're already inside the container and you're looking at security events, you can also be pulling performance metrics and other things in, in an APM type use case. I need that for my so app. I've got a question <laughs> for you on that, Matt. Though, whenever you're a company, let's just hypothetically say that Aqua is looking to get purchased. Is it better for that company to have a diverse portfolio or to basically have a specialization that's deep in a specific area um, so that you can match the niche that somebody that's looking to purchase you would be looking to fill? Well, I think you have to look at it two, two ways. I think you have to build a strategic relationship to get attraction to be acquired. And in the mm -hmm. case of the conversations that VMware and Aqua Security have been having over the years, this is a very relevant integration point because Pivotal is what VMware is going to use for its container platform. So by going deeper there makes a lot of sense strategically. So it makes it a really easy kind of integration if this acquisition happens. But you can't put all your eggs in one basket, John, as we all know, mm -hmm. because maybe it's not Microsoft or it's not VMware that makes this acquisition. Mm -hmm. Microsoft also has an investment in Aqua as well from, from the early days, or somebody else comes along and, and does this, right? So I think you have to look at strategic relationships and figure out how you integrate tightly, but you, you've also got to look at other integrations. And, and Aqua is supporting Docker and they're supporting Red Hat and the other container platforms that are out there. So they're not only limiting themselves to one, this is just an enhancement that I think puts them in a better strategic position with VMware. Nice. And there's so much technology to integrate with in the container DevOps space. Just tons, tons. A ton, yeah. You want to talk about prolifer pro proliferation of tools. <laughs> oh my DevOps God. DevOps is, it, it's, well, it's getting crazy. <laughs> and just development in general today. Like I know, John, we've had conversations like, is it Angular? Is it Angular 2? Is it like, what, <laughs> what is it, right? And then in well, the automation, there's Jenkins and Jack was well, telling me about a, another one uh, the other day, right? I, there's just and then you can like you can type. build your own stuff too, right? Like for mm -hmm. testing, you can use Selenium and build your own testing scripts. So 
you got to integrate with a lot of different technologies and integrate with a lot of different customizations, perhaps. And that complexity is just insane. Mm -hmm. um, it's just absolutely insane. Welcome to my world. Right? <laughs> we are using Jenkins better, right now, but bet, better that changes. That, well, that's the other thing, too, is once you modularize everything... Uh, and even deploy to one platform, you can take all your modules, some of your modules, swap them out, or take a subset of them and put them on a different platform, right? And mm -hmm. build a new application based on that foundation. So I think a lot of yeah. these companies are going to have a, a lot of different integrations. Well, and I think that can jump us to another story with Sonatype, um, yeah. Golang integration. Um, and this is definitely a play specifically into like Google Cloud Compute, which is weird. I didn't see this. I didn't see Google Cloud Compute mentioned mm -hmm. in this article, which I think was really something they overlooked. Um, but if you're looking at um, like Lambda, uh, predominantly Python based uh, for AWS, Golang is really what Google, because Google supports that particular language. Um, so yeah, you're going to see, just like you said, there's more support for different types of languages and frameworks uh, that are being thrown, expect, thrown into the mix, especially on the cloud side. And automation and trying to monitor all that, that's one of my main concerns. And I keep bringing this up in the show. And whenever we're looking at all these cloud security vendors, I see this huge discrepancy between what they're actually doing and what the actual attacks really look like. And I think it's going to take a while for them to mature to get to the point where they work at the level that they say just because of that complexity as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah, too bad you weren't with us last week because we had Michael I Aiello on from Google Cloud mm -hmm. Platform. And we talked about the shared oh, responsibility nice. model mm -hmm. and the different tiers. And this ties into the whole action item that's on my plate around cloud security. So we'll get there. But uh, yeah, I agree that? with you, John, right? <laughs> there is probably more that needs to be done there. What, you didn't get that task done the, the week before Black Hat and DEF CON? <laughs> what are you doing with your spare time? So. selling selling <laughs> <laughs> but for those of you that are listening to the show what we were talking about a couple of episodes back is what does a complete cloud security like package look like uh from end to end and that was something that matt i, think, I don't know if you volunteered or got volunteered for that one uh it was a combination of both but don't worry i, I it is on my task list to do fantastic and it is go in the the kind of back end of many applications today Oh, dear God, Go is showing up in everywhere. Everywhere, uh, right? So, yeah, for a little bit of background on Go, Go, uh, Google got a whole bunch of the original developers of C together mm. and said, if you were going to create C from scratch today, what would you do different? And they incorporated a lot of concepts of uh, like, like Python, some from Java, but they basically um, said this is their overall archetype on what they would do. Multi-threading would be built in. It would mm -hmm. compile right before it would execute. Uh, you could set up clustering very easily right out of the box. And Google basically gave them a blank check mm -hmm. uh, to do it. So it's very easy to develop in, very similar to Python. It's actually not similar from the syntax perspective to Python, but it's easy, like Python, gotcha. uh, to write highly functional code. And it's about 85 to 90% as fast as written in C. Yep. Uh, so that's the advantage of using Golang. Gotcha. I think you'd find it in the back ends of many like security oh, yeah. solutions today. Oh, we use it heavily just because of the analysis that we're doing. Uh, we, we use it all the time at, uh, for active countermeasures. It's awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, where do we want to go from here? Uh, Arduino has uh, selected Auth0 as a standardized login for the open source this ecosystem. Was cool. Yeah. I think we I kind of sometimes underestimate the technologies that have to be adopted by open source uh, projects. Mm -hmm. We're covering like a, a pro FTP vulnerability. And I'm like, who the hell's still using pro FTP? Like, I remember that back in the day being really vulnerable. And the article had like one point, And it's like, by the way, when you create multiple mirrors as part of an open source project or open source, you know, Linux distro, open uh, FTP, pro FTPD rather, is the FTP daemon behind a lot of those, yep. which is interesting. And, and they were rolling their own before, so taking a commercial standard product and embedding it in yeah. you know, probably makes a lot of sense for them because they don't have to manage their own identity access management solution as part of their right. ecosystem, and which it's is so, big. It's so critical to open source, larger, especially open source projects that have so many contributors. And how do you validate that this contributor is actually the contributor that their account has not been taken over that someone hasn't you know swiped their password somewhere and done password mm -hmm. spraying or whatever to gain access to their account because essentially if you can backdoor a popular uh, open source project of any kind that's a great way to distribute your uh, malware 
And that ties yeah. into this beautiful Venify story about new code signing solution. Yeah, you that's know, and, and that's on the runtime side, right? I mean, if well, I, it, so if I if I can take over a developer's credentials, I can sign the mm -hmm. code as them, and everything's good, right? So these well, are, I mean, they are related problems, Matt, in in the chain, right? But you have to make sure the developer is really who they say they are, and no one's impersonating them. And then when you sign the code, whatever's running the code has to check the signature to make sure it is. It, it, so it's a it's a chain of well, events. I, but I, but I think the main problem that they're trying to address is if you go to any development shops, um, you run into a situation where a whole bunch of different development groups have their own code signing certificates. Yep. And there's no centralization. There's no management of those code signing certificates. And they're all valid for that company. So I'll just use one case example. Uh, the Bit9 attack a long time ago was where Bit9 had a code signing certificate that they could sign their binaries that was trusted by Bit9. And they were compromised, and the attackers stole that code signing certificate. So the underlying point is the more code signing certificates you have mm -hmm. running ad hoc in your environment, the more it opens up this attack surface. So for developing kind of a centralized code signing certificate ability for large development shops, so you can have some control and visibility into that, is yep. huge. Yep. And this is one Not of those problems. Not just that, problems. but I think response is really yeah. important to know that, hey, oh, absolutely. one of our certificates is compromised. Let's revoke that immediately and, and reissue new ones, right? Absolutely. And then being able to do that quickly is yeah. very, very hard for most shops. So this is a cool thing because it's a problem I don't think a lot of people in security understand is a problem. And I also think a lot of development shops kind of felt it was a pain in the ass, but they never really looked yeah. at it as a problem. So this is a beautiful solution for that problem of code signing certificate creep in organizations. Yeah, we talked about ephemeral certificates on ASW on Monday. And, you know, one of the challenges managing all these certificates, right? And if you can centralize that get visibility in to all these different certificates you're issuing, I think it just helps make it easier for the developers to use it, know what's going on, have uh, the ability to revoke certificates that are bad, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is a great thing from a management perspective because that's where it gets really hard, I think, for a lot of development shops. And I'm trying to be better, you know, whenever I'm giving webcasts or on shows like this. So if you're somebody that's working in a shop and you want to implement this, how do you get management to move? And I think the examples would be, um, as I mentioned, the Bit9 example, and then also Duke uh, is the malware that specifically would sit on systems to steal code signing certificates and then get off of those systems. So there's been a number of different targeted level attacks that were designed at stealing code certificates. So when you're talking to management, Here's a solution to find the problem as it exists, but then also giving some historical context helps you explain things to management as well. Um, I wanted to discuss ExtraHop's uh, advisory about phoning home. And certainly I think they're in a perfect position to be able to observe this behavior so I can kind of like gather where it comes from. I mean, they're looking at all the traffic, right? And it sounds like they're observing certain types of software essentially phoning home. What And what is its purpose? How do you detect it? Uh, I thought that was interesting. So it's interesting because we, a lot of, sorry, John, I, oh, I was going to just, just say quickly, it's interesting because a lot of security solutions use a phone home capability. Mm -hmm. It's how they get out of the firewall and up to the cloud solution mm -hmm. to get data up there, right? And if you think about a lot of the solutions that are out there, they use phone home. The question is what's in that phone home traffic, which is the interesting part of this advisory is how much of private data or other data that that shouldn't be leaving is actually going out that channel. So, so let's go through some examples. Um, so these are examples that we've actually identified in a number of our customers over the past year. Um, TeamViewer, I think, would be mm -hmm. an excellent example. Uh, a lot of organizations will buy things like radiology machines. And then the company that manages those machines, they will actually go through and um, they will have remote access through software like TeamViewer. Um, so we were able to find this in a couple of hospitals, team viewer connections that were leaving. They were like, holy crap, that's weird. Looked into it, found out it was a vendor. And then you had that team viewer hack. Uh, I can't remember exactly when the team viewer hack it was, this was this year. So team viewer was compromised. And I think it was May is whenever this showed up that the comp, uh, the ch uh, Chinese had access since 2016. So anybody that was using team viewer for remote management was compromised. Another one was uh, nuance. Um, Nuance was using, uh, it's like Dragon, Nuance bought Dragon Naturally Speaking software. Wow. And they That's had the ability for, yeah, right? So a lot of hospitals and a lot of organizations still use that heavily. Mm -hmm. 
But if you had trouble with the software, you could enable remote management um, in the Nuance software, and then it would load, I want to say, like, like log me in. So or go yeah, to my which, PC type software. Yeah, yeah, okay. And if you enabled that for troubleshooting, you could disable it, but the vast majority of hospitals forgot to shut it off. So the nuance compromise coming back through was something like, I think that it was 45,000 or 50,000 uh, patient, patient records were um, known to be compromised specifically from that. Yeah, I was going to say a, a doctor yeah. using that for dictation is likely speaking yeah. about a patient's health record, right? Yep. So these are just a handful of examples of the things that we have discovered and embedded devices. You have uh, TVs, you have all these different things. And uh, we just got done with the carbon monoxide detector, I think. James was working on that. He's behind me. And as soon as it fired up, it phoned home immediately. So we have lots of examples to see this. And I don't know exactly what to call this because it's not quite vendor supply chain security management. Um, it needs a better name. And that's yeah. something we've been struggling with. Now, John, you've got some, uh, and I wanted to ask you this off air, but I'll ask it on air. Um, when you go in and do a test, in fact, you and I talked about doing this years ago. And I want to see where you're at with so you, you drop some a piece of software inside the company's network, and then you tell it to phone home, and it tries all the different ways to, to phone home. It, do you guys have yep. like a software suite that, that does that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you have an internal IP address that communicates to an external IP address and it attempts multiple protocols and multiple ports, mm -hmm. um, AI Hunter freaks out on that mm -hmm. right away. Gotcha. Um, you should see that connection go through on a single port. You'll run into some changes with Quick Protocol and SCTP. Um, those are a bit different. But yeah, if you have an internal system that's trying to communicate outbound across multiple different protocols, um, AI Hunter is like, this is, you know, you, you've tried 23 different ports to get out of this environment. It's time to let you let somebody know immediately if there's shenanigans at play. And uh, you, do you guys deploy code to like your customer to test that and test the detection? So we've got, well, two things. Um, yes, absolutely. We actually have a full box we can send to prospective mm -hmm. customers. The big thing that we've been doing quite a bit, and this is happening this week on an incident that we're working on in Bangkok, is uh, we're, we're doing AI Hunter, we're running it, and uh, Egypt is working the pen test. Yep. And we find this back door, and we're like, Egypt, is this you? And he's like, yes, that's me. Um, is this you? Yes, that, that's me as well. So we're testing a lot of our customers while we're doing mm -hmm. the forensics on it. So yeah, that's we're awesome. constantly testing and reevaluating that all, time, all the time with uh, Cobalt Strikes, um, uh, aggressor scripts and all the different types of C2 okay. profiles. So yeah, there. so there are there's tools that exist uh, to test that. Yep. So Cobalt if you're looking commercial, something. you would want to look at Scythe. Um, yep. Scythe is one that has multiple different C2 profiles, uh, CyberXM, and um, uh, if you want to go open source, you can do Caldera. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a number of different tools that'll emulate those various profiles. But Cobalt Strike is probably, from a pen tester's perspective, the most mm -hmm. flexible as far as what you can do. Mm. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, it's for, for those looking to test that. <clears throat> um, let's see. A checkpoint has introduced two new security gateways. I think we covered oh, this last week. We Unless did. this is two more new gateways on top of the last two. I'm not quite sure. No, no, I think you're it's right. It's doing one terabyte of threat prevention. Did you see that? The, the, uh, the what is it? The 16,000 base. Um, the appliance provides flexibility, tailored network storage, power supply configurations, over a terabyte per second of threat prevention. Holy Up to crap. 64 networking interfaces. What? It's crazy. <laughs> crazy. Got to keep the and base those, alive, man. <laughs> those cards are not cheap. Like, you're no. looking at very expensive cards that can run into terabit per second. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, Microsoft has acquired a Blue Talon, which is described as a cross-platform data access control solution provider uh, for an undisclosed uh, amount. I, I went to their website and I get what they say, you know, solutions provider, undisclosed data protection. I still don't know what the hell they do. Are they cloud-based? Are they on-prem? Uh, are they both? Uh, it's kind well, of wait, one of those horrible websites. Next generation of cloud data governance. Oh, okay. That's what it says. Yeah, it, it gets into some of the specifics around setting up uh, different uh, set of policies for uh, different database structures, right? So it, it allows you to monitor SQL, NoSQL, big data store, set policies, and look for mm -hmm. potential violations from a data governance perspective. I'm assuming it can run anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that for a fact. 
Um, but the one line in here that was interesting is it says the IP and talent acquired from Blue Talon. Yep. So that always flags this really interesting. Was this yep. an aqu aqua hire, right? Or did they mm -hmm. actually buy Blue Hexagon, which is maybe why it's an undisclosed uh, amount of money? I'm just yeah. it, was, it was kind of a weird sentence. Kind of sounds like Microsoft bought them to integrate with uh, Azure. Yes, they they definitely did. It's part of the Azure which data governance. They desperately group. need. God, they need that so bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good move for Microsoft from a data governance, data protection perspective in the cloud. I think this is probably a well, really good move for them if they can do a better job of giving tools to customers to control and manage their data in the cloud. Hallelujah, brother. Well, and Microsoft is light years ahead of like Google and Amazon in this respect. Um, as far as, you know, tying into Active Directory, Azure Active Directory, doing user behavioral analytics, looking at actual attacks and how those attacks work. Um, and I think that kind of shows their approach, right? They kind of did slow and steady uh, for developing a cloud platform that could integrate with enterprises. And uh, this is just a good, a good approach, uh, a, good high, a good purchase for that. But yeah, trust me, Microsoft is much, much, much better than Amazon and Google, whose whole approach seems to be, yeah, you all are on your own. Uh, Carbon Black uh, is proposed as updates to a cybersecurity kill chain model to help defenders stay ahead of modern attacks. I mean, yeah, is this really just stitching together the MITRE attack framework? Yeah. Kind of, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the framework is a big matrix of stuff, and I can see you, well, you combine multiple of those together to get, air quotes, kill chains, right? Or attack chains, I, or whatever you I'm, want I'm gonna, to call it. I'm going to recommend Carbon Black. Just, I'm going to talk to them directly you know, in the camera right now. Carbon Black, I hate cyber kill chain as well. I mean, it, trademarking basically what is the basics of computer security is insane. I've been fighting it for a long, long, long time. I haven't won. So I'm recommending to you, Carbon Black, let it go. <laughs> You're not going to beat the cyber kill chain. You're not going to undo the cyber kill chain. It's in books all over the place. People what, have been it, learning it, it since, it, so since who came preschool. Up with the, who came up with the That's cyber? Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin. Uh, yeah. So okay. basically, Paul, I'll boil it down. They you know how 504 is, here's an attack, here's the defense, here's an attack, yeah. here's the defense? Yeah, they basically took, ripped off 504 mm -hmm. and went through all the different attack techniques for different phases. And then they gave it a name, a cool name, by the way. Cyber Kill Chain was That's awesome. That's a cool name. And, I agree. And then mm -hmm. trademarked it. And that was that. I got you. Okay. So I, that's exactly what I wanted from you, John. I was curious on your thoughts on this one is, um, and, and you gave them to us very clearly. So thank you. Yeah. So give up carbon black, go with the flow. I am now part of the cyber kill chain army. Yeah. Perimeter 81 and Sentinel one provide a unified network and endpoint security. Perimeter 81 is touted as a pioneer in zero trust software defined network access and Sentinel One is the autonomous endpoint protection company. We have mm -hmm. lots of pioneers in zero trust networking. Yep. Just so you know. Because it's new. And yeah, it's new, and everybody's trying to be the pioneer in well, it. Well, they're touting so. it as new. I'm sure we could find a paper back in the 60s or 70s that <laughs> basically models zero trust. That's yeah, actually the premise of my keynote that I'll be giving later this year is that yeah. nothing's truly like innovative or unique. It borrows from something Just, from the past. You can just call it Marcus Ranum already did it. Yeah. Yeah, it actually is. Zero Trust is kind of a page right out of Marcus Random's brain, yeah. really. Yeah. You're right, John. So, so this is a, a networking vendor and an endpoint vendor coming together to create unified network and endpoint security just as we continue to abstract the network and the endpoint. Uh, well, but look, th they're absolutely right. This is where it's going. I think they have some statistics like 70, or is, well, if mobile workers will make up 75% of the U.S. workforce uh, worldwide mm -hmm. by 2020. Um, the, uh, the issue is your concept of an active directory, internal environment, a DMZ and a firewall, and then you set up all of your access, maybe have a VPN coming into it is, is going away mm -hmm. very quickly. Uh, Paul, we talked it's about gone. this on episode yeah. like, 500 or something like that in Security Weekly years ago. And we're now entering into the endpoint now is the edge of the network. It's all over the place. And how are organizations going to deal with that? And I used to think zero trust was just a total buzzword, dug into it a little bit deeper. And that's specifically what they're talking about is you can't trust the network you're on. You can't have applications that have transitive trust amongst each other. Mm -hmm. You get into single sign-on, that gets into some nightmares whenever you're dealing with uh, zero trust. So it is absolutely a thing. 
Um, but I don't necessarily know how it plays specifically with these two products, I guess. Well, uh, and it's agree. interesting. I, if firewalls were the wrong way to control security around users and applications that needed to talk and exchange data, right? To pull yeah. a page from Matt's app user data, right? And I think it's exciting because that's exactly where we're going, right? Is relying less on those network controls and more on the user application and data controls. Yep. Yeah, and so to the point, John, is you're right. Is the network the right place to do this? Is the endpoint the right place to do this? Or is it really the right place to do this at the user and the application layer, which is where we're going to see the proliferation continue to happen outside of the normal network? And, and that's where I think um, I would be more excited if this were a user and an app player talking yeah. about this than a network and an endpoint player. Yeah, or even well, a cloud play but, too, because your controls around applications in the cloud are really you do apply network controls, but they're basically tailored and uh, for the application. Mm -hmm. And Perimeter eighty one does a lot of that. Just to be completely honest, mm -hmm. um, they do. I mean, what they're talking about, what they're doing is awesome. We don't want to rip out their product at all. But I think predominantly, when we're moving forward to zero trust, everything right now is a science experiment. Um, no one has the solution. We're all trying different things. And when we're trying different things, does the technology work and will organizations be willing to adopt that technology? Um, those are two big questions that we have to work through. Um, so this is a much larger issue than just these two vendors, but this is where everything is going. And that's why I keep coming back to, you know, the problems that we have with cloud security and zero trust moving forward. And what does that actually look like over the next five years? I honestly don't know. Sweet. Well, that will conclude the Enterprise News segment for the show. Stay tuned. We're going to talk about security vendors coming up next.